Hey everybody, welcome to Flagcast. I'm Ryan Kirkpatrick and I'm here to help you explore the interesting world of vexillology. Now, what's vexillology, you might ask? Vexillology is the study of flags, with vexillum being Latin for flag and logia being Greek for study of. In this podcast, we'll be taking a look at flags, their history, their significance, and all sorts of the wonderful stuff associated with them. In today's inaugural episode, however, I'm going to go over the basics. Ratios, designs, what makes a good flag, what makes a bad flag, etc. But before we begin, I just wanted to say a couple things. First off, thank you guys for checking this out. This is a passion of mine, and well, some could say obsession, really. And I just want to help everybody understand everything behind the flag. Secondly, I'm really sorry for the title card logo thing being so pixelated. Microsoft Paint was too unforgiving, and um, I just didn't really, you know, want to open Photoshop because I don't have enough skill with it. So, um, hopefully that won't stay the logo forever. Hopefully that will change and look a little nicer sometime, but for now it'll have to do. So, without further ado, let's begin Flagcast. First off, I think it's fair to list some sources to help everyone out. If you want to buy a flag, the most ideal place to look is Amazon. There are thousands of different flags available, and a great deal of them can be bought for a really low price. That said, there are two kinds of flags sold on Amazon. The first being very thin, cheap flags that probably can stand more than five minutes flying outdoors. The material feels like a tablecloth, and the majority are around four to seven dollars, with some uncommon flags going around twelve to fifteen dollars. A caveat, though, you're getting what you paid for. These are flags most likely made in East Asia, and even though they're marketed as flyable and come with eyelets, I would not recommend flying them unless it's a perfect day outdoors without any wind or rain. They are ideal decor, though, and they're perfect for hanging up on a wall. I own several of them, and for the price I paid, I'd say, yeah, they're worth it. Uh, the stitching might be a little off here or there, and there's the occasional blemish, but they're hard to notice, and if you're looking for a cheap gift or pickup for the collection, you can't go wrong with it. The second kind of Amazon flag is the holy grail of flags, the mag flag. These are the highest quality flags you'll find sold on Amazon, and they have incredibly rare designs available. They're made in Germany, and they're very heavy duty. These are definitely the kind of flag you'd want to purchase if you're looking to fly it. The stitching is impeccable, and the colors are vibrant. But there is one downside, and it's kind of major. They cost a pretty penny. And the average mag flag is around $55 to $100. And unless you're in dire need of a particular flag or you just want to fly it, these might be just a little too expensive. That said, you are paying for quality. I own one and I currently have two in the mail, and I cannot swear by this brand enough. They're freaking awesome, really. And in all honesty, they have a monopoly on the rare and hard to find flag market on Amazon. A great deal of the time, they're the only retailer available for a specific flag. And, you know, because some flags are just so rare, you're going to have to go through these guys. But if the price worries you, fear not. Because if you go under the Magpac Amazon page um, and sort products by $25 or under, they've got some rare flags and some state flags for practically nothing. I, um recently purchased the independent state of Croatia and Austria-Hungary for about a total of oh, $17, including shipping. And I don't care if that's a flag you don't need for one of the 25s or unders. It's a cheap MAC flag. You need to get it. And I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, you will not regret it. Moving forward, let's take a look at some resources to help you learn about specific flags. Now the first is Wikipedia. There's a lot of good information on specific flags of the country, and it's really quick and easy to use. Unfortunately, some information does lack, especially with rare flags or the flags of you know, small countries in Africa and stuff. But for general info, it's probably your best source. Now the next place I'm putting out there is the Vexillology subreddit on Reddit, obviously. Duh. Now I stumbled by this place on accident, and here's where I discovered my love of flags. Sometimes it can be a little too full of redesigns without enough focus on actual flags, but you can find some good discussion. Definitely check this place out, and I just want to give a shout out to everyone on Vexillology because you guys make that place awesome. My third and final resource is flagspot.net. Don't let the look of the website throw you away, even though its interface looks 15 years old. 
Flag Spot is chock full of info, especially on the rare flags. You'll discover flags you could have never imagined before, and it's a really lovely place to lose yourself for hours in. Now that's all the resources I have for today. Let's go take a look at ratios now. In my opinion, the ratio makes the flag. Now there's two kinds of ratios that are well known. There's the 1 2, which is kind of elongated, and then there's the 2 3, which is kind of stubby. The Union Jack is 1 2, Italy is a 2 3. Now the United States is neither of those. It looks a little like a 1 2, but it's not a 1 2. The United States is a 10 19 ratio. Now, another flag with an odd ratio is Israel. They have an 8-11 ratio. But the civil, naval, and air force and signs are 2-3. Now, the only non-rectangular national flag is Nepal, and they have a 0.820 ratio. It's um, got a inner ratio. The red part is, a is actually 4-3, but... It has an irrational aspect ratio of approximately 1.21901033378. So, it's kind of unique in in a way. Then there are some square flags like Monaco and uh, Vatican City. So, that's ratios, and they're important because the ratio is really the flag. Now, let's take a look at the most basic and common designs. Now, the most basic pattern is the border. I mean, a lot of flags have borders. Um, a well-known example would be uh, Sri Lanka, which, you know, has a border around its flag. Um, you know, they're popular on older flags, and sometimes flags have, like, tassels on them that count as a border. Uh, the next popular design is the canton, and the canton is basically an insert in an upper corner, mostly the upper left. Uh, the most famous canton is Old Glory, the United States flag. Um, and then a lot of the British overseas territories and former British territories have uh, the Union Jack. And the canton is normally like a fourth of the flag, but not always. If you look at um, Bosnia-Herzegovina under the Yugoslav years, it was actually rather small. Now, moving on, there's the quarterly. The quarterly would be Panama. And four quarters, pretty self-explanatory. Then you have the Greek cross, which is on the flag of Greece, but it's in the canton, and the flag of Switzerland. You got the symmetric cross, which I'm blanking on examples right now because I'm doing this off the top of my head. Um, so let me just move on, but we'll look at the Scandinavian cross. The Scandinavian cross is basically on all the Scandinavian flags. That's why they call it the Scandinavian cross. Um, it's also on the Faroe Island flag. And moving back to the symmetric cross, England. I should have known that, but England is the symmetric cross. Now then you also have the Pales, Piles, I can't pronounce that. That would be like the flag of Peru, just without the symbol in it. Then you got the Fess, also known as the Spanish Fess. And that would be like a flag like Lebanon. You got the Benz, which is like a, it's like a sandwich cut into, you know, whatever they're called, diagonals. And uh, the Benz is, you know, simple, it's elegant. Classy sounds like I'm describing a car, but the flag of Sealand and which is a micronation they have um, Kind of a Benz design Then you got the Chevron which is popular on some aero flags like Palestine and Jordan just minus the stripes um, Puerto Rico Cuba You got the Paul which is on South Africa and then you got the Saltier which is on Scotland and Jamaica so that's pretty much it for flag designs. Now we will be moving on to what makes a good flag or a bad flag. So, what makes a flag good or bad? Now, I know this might not be like a popular consensus, but honestly, to me, it's the color. Certain shades of colors that touch do not belong on a flag. Republika Srpska, one of the entities in Bosnia, I mean, 
Red and blue a lot of times just don't look good when they touch, unless they're certain shades. Russia's flag looks okay, but Republic of Serbska, it just doesn't do it for me. Another, um, you know, color that does not look on flags, certain shades of yellow. Or when yellow and blue touch, it doesn't always look good. Uh, Bosnia's flag, you know, it's an odd flag, but it's just not very appealing with the colors. And I really want to get it because I'm a big fan of Bosnian history, but... It looked really good back when it was uh, the white flag with the uh, fleur de lis and the batch. Now, next, an important thing of a flag feature thing, entertain interchangeable. I am stuttering. I do not know why. I'm probably nervous. But <laughs> that would be the focal point. Now, the focal point can be a lot of things. It can be a star. It can be a moon and a star. It can be a sun. The point is, the focal point is the most important feature, if the flag contains one. Um, the focal point should be in the center or in the left, and if it's in the left, um, it either needs to cover like all of it or be in the upper left. And the focal point makes or breaks the flag. Good focal points would obviously be like um, flag of Turkey or a flag like Taiwan. Bad focal points would be like Haiti, which looks like it was made in Microsoft Paint, despite existing for over a hundred years. Or um, flags like um, Grenada, where it's a little kind of, you know, asymmetrical. Now, the symbol, focal point, whatever, should almost always be in the center or on the left. There are a couple of exceptions though. Uh, the flag of the Vatican, it's on the right. But that's okay in my opinion because the Vatican flag is a one by one ratio. It's a perfect square. And putting something in the middle, the middle, especially the symbol it possesses, just doesn't look very good in my opinion. Now, a flag with a good symbol on the right, that would be Nagorno-Karabakh. Without getting into too much detail, Nagorno-Karabakh is a breakaway state in Azerbaijan. It's mainly made up of ethnic Armenians, and they've been fighting for their independence for a while. Um, they want to join Armenia, but Armenia doesn't recognize them because Armenian um, Azeri relations are very bad, and the war is probably going to break out soon, to be completely honest, but they don't recognize them simply because they don't want to worsen relations further. And Nagorno-Karabakh's flag, I mean, if you look at Nagorno-Karabakh on a map, which I'm pulling up right now, it's, you can see the symbolism here. It looks like an 8-bit triangle. It's not. It's like the actual Nagorno-Karabakh region sliding into Armenia. It's ge geographically correct, and it looks pretty sweet when you think about the symbolism behind it. You don't see a lot of flags doing that, and it's simple, and unless you know about it, it's not going to look good, but once you know about the history and significance behind why it has that on the flag, damn, it looks good. Now, I have one thing I want to say. Writing, for the most part, does not belong on flags. Now, some exceptions, it's okay, especially if it's in kind of like a crest or banner or something. It, you know, that's like the really the only exception. Other times, it's not good, like really bad. Um, one example for good would probably be Saudi Arabia, where it's Arab calligraphy. And that, that actually looks good because it's not in a Latin alphabet, so it does look pretty, it looks more like art. Um, an example where it's bad is in Cyrillic for the... Donetsk and Donetsk and Lugansk, I'm butchering the pronunciations, but the um, breakaway states in Ukraine right now, they have writing on their flags. The writing does not look good. You do not put writing on a flag if it looks like that. It looks piss poor. If they just kept the two-headed eagle, which is similar to Albanian, in place and got rid of the writing, it would look good. It would look pretty awesome, honestly, even though I'm not a huge fan of the black on top, but still, it would look really good. But 
the writing on there makes it look, you know, like a banner or an advertisement. A lot of the earlier um, Soviet flags did the exact same thing. And in my opinion, it just doesn't look good. Now that we basically covered all the basics of flags, for the remainder of the episode, I'm going to go over the flags I own. I own three flags, and I treasure them with my life, um, as weird as that may sound. So let's go over them. Now, the first flag is the flag of the former Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. It was the flag of the Yugoslav state from 1918 to 1992. That's when all the wars broke out and everything really went downhill. Now, the flag is pretty cool, I think. Um, even though it's pretty simple, a lot of flags have red, white, and blue and stars. But the flag's design, color-wise, comes from the Pan-Slavic movement because the majority of people in the Balkans are... Um, South Slavs, and red, white, and blue are Slavic colors. Uh, Yugoslavia was a united South Slavic state that seceded from uh, Austria-Hungary, or more so was given independence. Um, and it was first used by the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, San Star, from 1918 to 1943. Now, as we all know, little World War II took place, and yeah. But the side that won were the Yugoslav partisans, who were communist, and they added the star being socialist. Now, there are two different ratios. There's the national flag, which is a 1-2 ratio, and it was, um, you know, it was officially taken honor, place, whatever. It was officially adopted, I should say, on, um... January 31st, 1946. Now, the second flag is the civil and state ensign. It was adopted on March 21st, 1950, and it's got a 2-3 proportion. That's the one I own. And, you know, if you look at the flag side by side, they look really similar, except the variant flag, um, the 2-3 one, the gold around the star is actually a bit thicker, and I think it looks pretty nice. Now, there's also a third variant flag, which is the naval ensign of Yugoslavia, and it's a canton of the Yugoslav flag with a wreath around the star, and then a red field. Now, fun fact about Yugoslavia, it was the pretty much the only socialist state that wasn't aligned with the Warsaw Pact, and it was independent. And the flag is actually um, pretty meaningful to a lot of those who hold nostalgia for the former Yugoslavia, um, also known as Yugo Nostalgia, which is really, like, big in citizens of the former Yugoslavia. Um, a lot of people still worship Tito, a lot of people still think life was better under Tito because, you know, there weren't any wars or genocide. So, that's the Yugoslavian flag, and my flag just fell down, and I'm going to have to hang that up when I'm done with this recording, but um, moving on, we're going to take a look at the flag of Lebanon. Now, Lebanon, it's a little tiny country north of Israel in the Levant of the Middle East, it's a Spanish fest, meaning that the triband in the middle is a bit wider than the one on the top and the bottom. It's got a 2-3 ratio, and it was formally adopted on December 7th, 1943. And it's also known as the Christmas tree flag because it's got a giant green tree in the middle. Um, this is really a very symbolic flag. It's a very cool flag, and... The symbolism actually comes from the cedar tree. Uh, the cedar grows in the mountains of Lebanon, and it's very important uh, to Christianity. It's mentioned several times in the Bible, especially in the book of Psalms. And it's got a lot of significance because Lebanon has the largest Christian population in the Middle East. 
uh, with the Maronite Church. So that's the Lebanon, and it's got a cool flag. And actually, when the Ottoman Empire fell, and um, just before France took it as a colony, it had the same tree, but it was on a white background. And when it was the French mandate of Lebanon, it actually had the tree, but it had the French uh, tricolors, uh, which, you know, pretty cool. So my last flag to talk about on the day is a place I can nearly guarantee you have not heard of. And that would be the flag of Kalmykia. Now, I want you guys to take a guess. Where's Kalmykia? No answer? That's okay, because how until I saw this flag for the first time, I would have had no idea. Now, Kalmykia, it's a Russian republic um, near the border of Dagestan, it's like just in the north of the uh, Caucasus region. And it's the only Buddhist majority republic in all of Europe, strangely enough. And that's because um, the ancient Mongol tribes, they would graze and take their animals out, you know, to look for food. And they eventually, like, made it all the way out here. So the people of uh, Kalmykia are actually descendants of uh, the ancient Mongols. And because of that, they have a pretty sizable Buddhist population. Um, it's a really strange republic, honestly. They've got, in their capital city of uh, Alista, they've got the largest Buddhist temple in Europe, and they also have a ton of stuff related to chess. Their uh, former president, um, I'm blanking on the name, but he was absolutely obsessed with chess to the point he was taking federal funding and spending it just on chess-related stuff. And there was actually a journalist who was going to kind of oust him, saying, you know, hey, look at what the president's doing with all the money he's spending on chess. That journalist was killed by a hitman. Now, nobody knows who placed the hit, but I think we all have a pretty good idea. So back to the flag of Kalmykia. Now, the yellow stands for the sun. And it also stands for the people and the uh, religious faith, which would be Buddhism, of the Republic. The blue represents the sky, eternity, and steadiness. And the lotus is a known Buddhist symbol, and it stands for purity, spiritual rebirth, and happiness. Its upper five petals represent the continents, and the lower four stand for the quarters of the globe. And together, this is coming from the wiki, they symbolize the will of the Kalmyks to live in friendship and to cooperate with all nations of the world. Now, if you guys know anything about Buddhism, um, Siddhartha Gautama, he, you know, sat in the lotus position when meditating. So, there's a ton of symbolism with this flag, and I got this as a gift from a friend for Christmas. I briefly mentioned it to him, um, just saying, hey, this is a really cool flag. And he will not believe how surprised I was when I got it. It's my favorite flag, personally. Because um, the symbolism behind it and the lotus is just really pretty. So, that's actually my mag flag. And I think it's falling because it's so heavy. And the painter's tape I'm using to hold it up isn't doing such a great job. So, that's pretty much all I have for today, guys. And if you want to learn more about flags, go to the places I mentioned earlier in the sources. You can also check the link in, links in the description, and it'll take you there. Um, so that's really all I have for this week. I just want to thank you guys for helping me out, you know, like listening to this, because I really appreciate it. And I want to thank you guys for... Um, you know, having the patience to listen to this because I'm recording this without a microphone. I'm actually using it on a Mac. So the audio quality is terrible, I'm sure, and I'm you know, stuttering. And I'm, I'm, I had a script for like the first half of this and then I didn't feel like writing one. So I'm doing this mostly off the top of my head, which, you know, presents itself as a little bit of an issue. 
So thank you guys so much for listening. And yeah, that's that's really it. So I'm hoping you guys enjoyed Flagcast. Next week's episode um, is going to be on the jihadist flags. You know, there's so much going on in the world regarding uh, Islamist terrorism. I think we should have an episode devoted to covering all these. Because even though they all look the same, they're really different. And that's going to be next week's episode. And, well, that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, Thank you guys so much, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your days. Bye.